going on? This is Paul Ravella here from ProPhysique.com. Today I'm going to do my first ever question and answer video log based on some questions that I posted on my Instagram and my Facebook page. And uh, these are just my opinions and my advice and if you don't like it then um, take a hike. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So Fierce Strength uh, on Instagram, who is actually Colby Smith, asks Alright, I've always wondered, why is it that some people eat well below their theoretical or predicted TDEE, which is the ta total daily energy expenditure, and yet still aren't losing weight? Many adults, mostly middle-aged women, who eat 12 to 1400 calories a day, but maintain weight at 170 to 80 pounds, any insight is appreciated. So this is something that has become quite the trend in the last few years, and especially amongst physique competitors, who tend to really diet for long periods of time and then follow that up with uh, overeating cycles and do quick body fat regain. So the predicted total daily energy expenditure, or um, it might also be referred to as basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate, is the energy or the calories that you can expect to burn at a certain age, at a certain body weight. What we know now is that these numbers really don't mean a whole lot. What's more important is the person's history of dieting. For men, it tends to be less of an issue because men don't place such emphasis on being a certain size or weight. Men don't place a value on being at a lower weight or a lower clothing size. Women tend to place a little bit more emphasis on this. Not judging, this is just a fact of life. Uh, as someone who, you know, has a wife and works with women and has a lot of female friends, I'm very aware of this and it plays an important role. So what comes into play there is if you diet on low calories for a long time and are very active, the metabolism adapts. Metabolisms are adaptive. So when you hear someone talk about their metabolism, that is not a static thing. That is a number that can fluctuate. It can change. So someone who is maintaining a body weight of 180 pounds on 1200 calories a day and is training and they look at what their energy expenditure is and they can say well I'm burning four to five hundred calories a day and I'm only eating 1200 why am I not losing weight well you're not actually burning four to five hundred calories a day those calculations are based on predictive numbers when you plug a number into a cardio machine and it says you burn 400 calories that's a predicted number as you get into better shape and your body adapts, you're not burning as many calories. Think of it like this. If two people can be the same height and weight, but one is a much more trained athlete, it's who's going to burn less calories? The athlete who is adapted to that training is going to burn less calories. This is why I, as a coach, don't like to use the calories burn method for cardio. You know, get on there and do 300 calories burn doing your steady state cardio. So that is why that someone can possibly maintain their weight at well over their natural set point. Now there are strategies for, for, for changing that and one of those strategies is called a reverse diet, uh, metabolic building, whatever, pro whatever you want to call it. The goal there is to add calories in to restore your body's metabolism. How long does that take? That's another big question that I get all the time. The rate of re restoration is roughly equal to the amount of time that you had your calories severely restricted. So for, for people who have been restricting their calories for years and years and they want to do a reverse diet in 12 weeks, it's really unlikely to be successful. You have to commit to it for the long term. What I can tell you through working with clients is that if you do commit to this process, there will be a, a point a threshold where your body will make the change. It will switch into a more um, predictable mode where you're actually losing body fat eating more calories than you were before because you're allowing your body to uh, perform as it should. On your heavy squat days, what is your warm-up routine like? Do you do any foam rolling or band work? And how do you typically progress weight-wise before you start your working sets? So I haven't been squatting heavy for a while now, but I'll just... I. I follow the same process for all my deadlifts, bench, um, whatever power movement I'm doing that day. So for a while I actually was doing some foam rolling and band work, 
but I've stopped doing that and I'll explain to you why. I really believe in the dynamic movements for warming up. For me personally, and for those that you know want to listen to what I have to say, I feel it's best if you're warming up for a squat to warm up doing the movement. Warm up doing some body weight squats. Now if you need to, if you're very, um, if during the day you are very immobile or you're stationary or you don't have a job where you're getting up and down and you're just sitting all day, then it may be best for you to get into the gym, walk for five minutes, ride a bike for five minutes, just get some blood into the ligaments and joints of the lower body, get things moving, and then start. Once you're there, I would start with body weight squats. I would start with body weight squats and, you know, just 15, 20 reps, just get the blood moving. Um, and then I would start with the squat movement with the bar, with just the bar. There's no rush here. I would do another 20 to 30 reps with just the bar. You know, whatever your one rep max is, you may make jumps of, you know, at that point you may make a jump up to 135. Uh, if the ego is not driving you, you can start with 95 pounds. Personally, I've been in the gym long enough. I don't like to make big jumps. I'll just go 95 pounds, then I'll go 135, then I'll go 185, 225. I like to make 30, 30 to 40, 30 maybe 50 pound jumps per set. When I was squatting, you know, 400 pounds at that time, I would I would follow that that progression every day. BCAA recommendations when cutting and bulking, and this is Rasmus Winther. Thank you, Rasmus. So my recommendations for branch chain amino acids when cutting and bulking. The term bulking, first of all, is uh, to basically defined as eating a surplus of calories. Depending on where I'm at um, in a surplus of calories, my branch chain amino acids will remain focused primarily around my workout. But when cutting, I really find it necessary to take branch chain amino acids uh, five grams between meals uh, and then I take them at, at, during my workout as well. That's the brand I recommend, Core Nutritionals. This is the white apple strawberry. I also happen to really like uh, watermelon, white peach. Um, so Core Nutritionals, Core ABC. I recommend taking that five grams between meals. Definitely when cutting, uh, when bulking. Um, you know, you can take it between meals but I find that I'm able to keep my calories high enough that, you know, between my large doses of meals, I'm actually taking in some snacks in between. Um, and the research has shown that 50 to 60 grams of carbohydrates between meals can stimulate protein synthesis similar to the amino acids. Now, when calories get low, the benefit there is, of course, that that has zero calories. So you can get the same response without having to take a large dose of carbohydrates because not a lot of us can handle 60 grams of carbohydrates between meals while in a cutting phase. Cynthia Grace. Hello, Cynthia. I want to know your opinion on creatine supplementation when cutting. Also, what has been the biggest challenge thus far as a coach and as a competitor? So that's like a three-part question. So my opinion on creatine supplementation when cutting. In my opinion, there's no reason to not take creatine at any point in your training. It's only beneficial. There are no drawbacks. Creatine saturates the muscle cells, so you can take it year-round. It's not something that has an acute effect. So it doesn't matter if you take it once a week right before your workout. That's not going to have the, the benefit. That's not the proper way to take it. You want to take it every day. For men, I usually recommend 5 grams a day. For women, I usually recommend 3 grams a day. Um, I personally, I just happen to take it pre-workout because a lot of the pre-workout products that I use will actually have some in there, so I just make sure I get it pre-workout. What matters most is that you just take it every day. So I just suggest taking it at the same time every day. So when cutting, I find it's very important. Uh, when you're at a caloric deficit, that's when you're at the biggest risk for muscle loss. And creatine is very good for hypertrophy. So I feel like those two are hand in hand. The biggest challenge as a coach is dealing with all the different personalities, all the different types of uh, clients that are out there. As an online coach, I find that there is a vast array of people that need different types of motivation, they have different types of work ethics, they have, they have different types of requirements, so I have to be very adaptable. Um, I never look at a client as being a bad client, I look at every client as an opportunity to be a better coach. If I'm not communicating properly, if I find a client is getting frustrated with me 
and it's come to the point a few times where clients have actually had to send me an email just telling me that they weren't happy. Those are the opportunities that I take to become a better coach because you have two options in those instances. And that is to get pissed off and tell the client to go to hell and basically end that relationship. Or you can turn that into a positive. You can say, okay, well, what have I done here? My biggest challenge has been learning how to adapt to each individual client. I don't send the same plans. I don't send the same emails. Everyone that I work with kind of gets a varied approach based on what I feel they need and what they're comfortable with. Uh, and then as a competitor, what has been the toughest thing? The toughest thing for me as a competitor has been really just understanding where I fit in the fitness community because as much as I would like to be Arnold Schwarzenegger or Franco Colombo or you know Bob Harris or some of the great bodybuilders or heck even Brian Whitaker or some of my you know Doug Miller like those role models I have to understand that I have certain limitations uh, as a physique competitor but I can't let that derail my motivation or my progress and so the transition that I've taken in the last see I started competing in 2008 so the last seven eight years has basically been to really appreciate myself and really appreciate what I'm capable of doing and my physique is capable of looking like and although I strive for the greatness that, that I see in those that I admire not to get down on myself or doubt myself or lose that drive and motivation because I understand that there are some things I'm not capable of it's like if you know someone who's five feet tall wants to play center for the Los Angeles Lakers they can work their butt off they're never gonna play center for the Los Angeles Lakers um, doesn't mean they can't be amazing at basketball and I love the sport and it's the same for me I may never be the world champion of natural bodybuilding or I may never reach you know some of the goals that I would like to but that doesn't mean I can't be a damn good competitor a damn good role model and uh, you know create something that I'm proud of and um, in the last couple of years that's really helped me change my enjoyment level but it's still the toughest thing for me because I'm not I'm not capable of doing everything I would like to do I'm not gonna ever have 23 inch arms and huge chest like Arnold you know these are just um these are just things that are you know they're limitations but I'm okay with that